Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode in the Head Acoustics Educational Webinar Series. My name is Jacob Sondergaard, and I will be your host today. Today's topic is all about packetized voice and audio. So today's session is not meant to be a history lesson on the type of networks that we have available to us for communicating with voice and audio. Rather, we'll start by giving you a brief overview of the old circuit switched network and the newer packet switched networks. And then more importantly, look at how does that impact some of the testing that we have to do? How does it add complexity into our product design? And what do we do to compensate for that? So some of the elements we'll be talking about today are all the way down to the fundamental delay measurements and what happens at that stage. We'll look at DTX, which stands for discontinuous transmission, and CNG, so comfort noise generation. We'll look at network impairments. And then it's not all doom and gloom because we'll also wrap up with a little poetic session on speech quality, audio quality, and what that means for packet switched calls, not just 4G LTE, but also as we zoom into the future with 5G networks. So the easiest way for me to illustrate the differences between circuit switch calls and packet switch calls is by the handy dandy image I've displayed in front of you. So the two teal phones are making a direct call using the blue line. That would be our circuit switched illustration through the network, the cloud, so to speak. And if we start with the circuit switch, guys, um, what we essentially have are two nodes in the network that establish a dedicated communications channel, so before any communications may begin. And in doing so, we guarantee the full bandwidth on that line is available to us for the duration of the call, even if silence is transmitted. So uh, a good analogy for that is to visualize them as essentially being connected almost physically, just like they are in a, or would be in a electrical circuit. Now, a good example of this is the old POTS, so the plain old telephone system analog network, where way back when you would try to dial somebody and you would get a hold of an operator that would literally move wires around to ensure that we have a continuous stream of copper connecting you at point A to the person you're trying to call at point B. And as long as you guys are connected, in that scenario, then you guys have full control over that length of copper and nobody else can intrude or use that path. Now, what that means from a communication standpoint <clears throat> is all the audio and voice that we are transmitting will always travel along that same path or that same circuit or that same copper wire, however you want to imagine it on the network. And that all our information will always arrive sequentially. So additionally, what we have is at the time the call is established or the communication channel is established, we also end up with not only the fixed bandwidth, but also a fixed delay. The channel is what the channel is. And it can either be good or bad. In some cases you end up with a poor connection, maybe a lot of noise on it but it is what it is and it doesn't change. That also means that if we lose the path of the connection is severed, literally the electrical connection, then we also drop the call and there's no way for us to bring that back. Now, in some sense, that way worked for a while, but it wasn't the most effective way to handle a lot of information on the network. So one of the major downsides is the inefficiency of having a single wire or a communication path dedicated 
to that single communication um, channel. And that's where packet switch calls comes into play. So on packet switch calls, now we're using the two red phones on either side of the network that are digitizing and packetizing the audio. So it's so once the audio is digitized and encoded, it's also chopped into tiny little packets. And each of these little packets will include header information with the destination and also information about which order they were encoded in. And then they're shot into the network, kind of like a shotgun spray. Just packets go into the network, and then each little packet will traverse the network and figure out how to get to point B. So obviously the, the, the example or implementation of that is our current internet LTE networks, voice over IP networks that we have available today. They are fundamentally connectionless, and the routing is determined by the network conditions of that moment and the packet trying to get from point A to point B. As you can imagine, due to varying network conditions, uh, congestion, things like that, some packets will get delayed, maybe even lost, which means at point B, we don't always receive the information in the same order that it was sent from point A. Not only that, so that sort of addresses the variable delay issue that we could run into with packet switch calls, but we also have variable bandwidth. So I'm sure you guys have been on a call, a 4G LTE call, with, let's say you're doing an HD voice or a wideband call, and all of a sudden, because of poor connections, the call drops from a wideband call to a narrowband call. I don't know if you've experienced that. I, I'm assuming you have, but that's something that with the packet switch calls, we can do that on the fly depending on network conditions. Now, I also touched on the packet loss issue because sometimes packets do get lost or what is essentially the same here is they get delayed indefinitely. In other words, they really just don't reach the phone until it's way too late. And for practical purposes, we would consider it lost. And in some cases, packets can get corrupt. So unfortunately, networks aren't perfect, nor the phones, nor the reception or the, the uh, signal strength. And so we run into issues with the packet switch calls. But of course, it does open up possibilities due to new codecs and encoding methods and decoding methods to transmit audio and video for that matter and data in general in much higher quality and you can start to just interlace or intermingle packets from different calls on the same communication path and thereby maximize your channel efficiency from a network perspective. So today's session is all about how does that packet switching affect our testing from a voice and conversational quality perspective? So with that in mind, let's take a look at the telecom tests. We've already gone through some of these on a basic fundamental level, but there are some of these where we have identified issues during uh, packet switching. So for instance, with the introduction of a jitter buffer and packet loss concealment algorithms, you're going to see your delays go up. So that's something that, for instance, is implemented on the receive side only in the delay direction. I'll, I'll go into a lot more detail on this, but in general, we'll talk about delay and we'll talk about how it affects the receiving side of things. And as we talked about in previous sessions, delays generally go hand in hand with conversational quality. So we'll talk about some of the double talk performance and echo tests and what we do there and the importance of it. And then due to things like packet loss and jitter and delay, 
and packet duplication and corruption, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about speech quality. So those elements generally tend to affect speech quality. So we'll get into all of that in this session. As we keep harping on, delay is something that adds up very, very quickly and something that can really affect your ability to, to have a normal conversation. So this should be a familiar plot if you've been with us in the past. All right, so it illustrates a hands-free or a headset, a Bluetooth hands-free or headset device that's connected to a mobile phone. Each block will introduce its own elements of processing and resulting delay. And where things start to differ for packet switch calls over the traditional circuit switch calls is you might see slightly longer delays in the sending direction. So once your voice on the near end gets encoded, it also has to get packetized and transmitted. It might result in slightly longer delays going up into the network. And then as you receive sound, remember, we just touched on the fact that those packets that you're receiving from the network might not show up in the right order or at all. And so you need to have some processing on the receive side or the downlink direction side here at the bottom in red that will definitely add to the overall delay. So let's start with the jitter buffer and delay. So this was not illustrated on the previous slide, but the idea is if you assume these packets each represent 20 milliseconds of audio, in general, we would love to see the packets arrive sequentially. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all showing up with 20 milliseconds of continuous audio that we can just decode and present to the user. In our little contrived example here, what we have is the green voice packet, packet number five, showing up way too fast, and the red voice packet, so packet number three, showing up way too late. So we have variable delay that is essentially what we call jitter. And on the receive sign, we'll have something called a jitter buffer. That jitter buffer is essentially a long buffer or array that it intentionally delays all the packets that are coming to the phone and then looks at the header information of each packet. So remember when the packets are first encoded and transmitted, we include not only the destination information, but we also include the sequence with which it was sent. So packet number three will include information about, hey, I need to come after packet two, and I need to come before packet four, and so on. So each packet has that information. And the voice processor, basically the jitter buffer management system on the receive side of your device, now has to take all these packets and very quickly figure out, how do I organize these? so I can decode and present the actual audio signal to my user so that there's no gaps or distortion or any odd effects in the reproduced sound. As we mentioned, this jitter can occur because of timing drifts, routing changes, network congestion, etc. And so what that means from our testing perspective is that delays or measuring delays is no longer as simple and straightforward as it was with our good old circuit switch calls. Here we're really at the mercy of the network in many cases. So remember with the circuit switch calls, once we set up a call, that's it. Those are our call parameters and our delay parameters. We can measure delay once, it's pretty straightforward. And we're good to go. In this case, due to jitter, due to varying delays, due to network con uh, network conditions, things change. 
So if we look at our actual delay measurement, the process and the theory is still the same. We still want to measure the overall latency when speech is sent out and when it is received. Nothing really changes there. What's really important to mention here is it still affects echo cancer performance or can affect echo cancer performance. It makes your work more difficult if you're making echo cancers. It has the potential to introduce unintended double talk. And with the network conditions for something like an LTE, 4G, voice over IP situation, we have that potential for variable delay to the dust makes things a lot more tricky. Now, in general, we always talked about delays and processing being more intensive on the sending side, but just due to the introduction of the jitter buff in the receiving side, we now also start to add a lot more delay in the receiving side. So things just start to go up. So what you might see from us or generally here in the marketplace is recommendations for more frequent delay measurements. So before you start doing any important measurements, we might recommend that if you're in an LTE type of call or packet switch call, Simply do the delays immediately before you do the actual test so you ensure that you capture the current network conditions or as close to the current network conditions as possible. Now, in general, the measurement is exactly the same. We'll usually use something that's very quick to do and quick to execute, something like a CSS burst. And then we do the cross-correlation analysis. I won't spend too much time doing that. You can visually see it in the time domain, but the cross-correlation analysis gives us that one number for the overall delay. Now, in addition to the variable delay, what, what else is new to packet switch calls is having to account for the potential clock skew in the measurement device relative to your reference device. Because if we don't account for that clock skew, what we could do is introduce unintended packet loss during long-term testing. So if we refer to 3GPP, this was, I believe, the first group to adopt test procedures to account for the clock synchronization or, or the skew, the offset. And the idea being is if you're processing at 48 kilohertz and the device is running at 48.002 kilohertz sampling, then over very long test periods, those few parts per million will end up meaning that the packets will get out of order and we start to potentially lose packets during our long-term testing. So the idea with this measurement that we now recommend, at least in 3GPP, they recommend it, but it's good practice, is to reset your reference device to 48 kilohertz. And then we inject a very long stimulus signal, so typically 160, sec uh, 160 seconds. We either use a single spoken utterance or we use the good old CSS burst. And then we use a delay versus time function to calculate the parts per million, the PPM, drift over the 160 seconds worth. So after we've done that first measurement, what we can do is we can adjust the clock of our reference device so that it has the same exact sampling frequency as the device under test. And if we redo the test again, what 3GPP tells us is we ought to be, our clocks ought to be synchronized to within 0.8 parts per million. Now, if you do the math and you think about 40, uh, 48 kilohertz sampling rate, 20 millisecond packets, 0.8 parts per million, it ends up meaning that in the course of four or eight hours of continuous testing, 
without adjusting for the clock's sync or the clock skew later on, you will not incur any potential packet loss. Now, just, just a quick note, if the initial clock sync or clock skew measurement shows that you have more than 50 parts per million offset, then 3GPP actually tells us that the calculation may be inaccurate so that we ought to consider it really just a crude estimate. And so they recommend doing it again once you've readjusted the clock once and then do the final validation to see if you're within 0.8 parts per million. So all of this can be found in TS-26-131 and TS-26-132 if you're interested in more information on this particular test. But it's something that's good advice and something we have to account for with delays. Now, let's shift gears and talk about discontinuous transmission, or DTX. This is a new and cool feature that makes a ton of sense for packet switch calls because this is something that is a lot more bandwidth efficient. Now, it does make sense for circuit switch calls, remember, because our communication path and our communication channel is locked between our two devices, so there's really no need to be so mindful of the bandwidth and potential conservation of the bandwidth. But now that we have multiple packets from multiple callers jumping onto the same path, and traveling along until they disperse and find their destination, it would be great if we could conserve that bandwidth even further. So at its core, what DTX does is it detects silences on the near end. So one of the beauties of speech, I guess, is the inclusion of pauses. It could be for emphasis. It could be for thought. It could be for a lot of things and just the natural flow of speech. There's always pauses in between words and pauses in between sentences. So what the DTX methodology does is it looks for those silences and says, hey, my person on the near end is not talking. I don't think it's prudent to encode what is essentially nothingness, silence, and packetize it and send it. So if you look at the very bottom, for instance, for AMR wideband at 12.65 kilobits per second, we're investing 253 bits per core frame, a 20 millisecond core frame, to encode audio, regardless of whether that audio is actual speech, voice, music, or whether that audio is silence. So what DTX does is it looks for continuous periods of silence and says, I have a nice big block of silence. Let me grab all this, encode it as one big block, about 160 milliseconds, and send that off as a very condensed bit of information. So that's what we call a SID frame. And that SID frame, so SID stands for Silence Insertion Descriptor, but that SID frame will replace multiple blocks of encoded audio and will be received on the far end where if the phone is smart enough, that phone will say, oh, look, I just have a whole bunch of silence for the next 160 milliseconds. Let me inject some comfort noise on the local device to simulate uh, to simulate the the silence or the non-speaking portion of the audio at that moment. Now at the very bottom you'll see that what a SID frame contains is really only 40 bits worth per core frame of data. So equivalent to only two kilobits per second bit rate, much, much less than something like typical AMR wideband. So from a network perspective, what the discontinuous transmission does is it allows the network or the carriers to cram even more data 
and more people allowing more people to make calls on the same path. Now, a note about DTX. So in AMR, according to the standards, it is, first of all, a an included codec feature, but it is enabled by default. Now, for EVS, which is a mobile codec, enhanced voice services, um, a mobile phone codec that is meant to introduce super wideband, full band, also does narrowband, wideband, um, does binaural or stereo channels, uh, does lots of cool stuff, and, and the and the codec features also hold up pretty well to music, actually very well. Anyway, EVS, uh, it, it is also a standardized codec feature, but it's something that we have to configure during the initial uh, codec setup and the call setup. So minor differences that you have to be aware of when you're testing either AMR or EVS. Now, this in theory seems very uh, a very good feature to have as a network provider. Of course, it means that your devices have to be capable of discontinuous transmission. So your device has to be capable of generating SID frames. But also, from a receiving perspective, you may also have to be able to inject comfort noise. So if you guys remember the early voice over IP calls, when somebody was not talking, you would literally hear nothingness. You would hear absolute silence because what the phones were transmitting were digital zeros. And this was before the age of comfort noise generation. This is something that can be particularly jarring, something that's very uncomfortable, that when you're on a call with somebody and they maybe pause for a minute, the line goes completely dead. Usually gets you to uh, ask them if they're still there, if the call is still active. So what your phones have to be able to do is inject comfort noise in order to maintain the conversational qualities of the call. Now, another thing is how do you handle the transition between, so if somebody is calling you and they're standing in a noisy environment, when they are speaking, I'm sure their noise suppressor will do its very best to suppress the noise during speech. But what about when they pause? Is the noise suppressor so good and the voice activity detector is essentially detecting no near in speech that so you just get silence? How does your phone handle that transition between the noise that is presented during speech and the potential comfort noise that is generated during the silences? Does it end up being something that's heavily modulated? That's another element that you have to consider with discontinuous transmission and comfort noise. And you'll have to balance things like the comfort noise generation during just quiet calls because we don't want the idle channel noise to get too high or too low for that matter either. So just to reiterate and be clear, if we have a sequence of many packets, let's say 15 packets, and it's roughly spaced with speech and silence, speech and silence, the idea is for speech, we'll still encode and transmit and packetize each of the blocks of speech, but then we'll lump together big chunks of silence as one frame, which we can do very, very effectively. And then on the far end, we'll have to say, hey, these this big sequence of audio is actually not audio because it's encoded with the header information for a SID frame. I'm just going to present hopefully some comfort noise to my user. Now let's look at the idle channel noise. So this is something that we've done before where we're just looking at the self noise of our device. So we do it both in the sending direction and in the receiving direction. Uh, typically, 
the measurements were more critical in the sending direction. The assumption being that mm, maybe we're using, we are using cheap microphones, generally speaking. We're mass producing these devices. We can't afford to spend five or ten bucks per mic. But hey, there are trade offs. And in some cases, there's a high noise floor. But it could also be things like electrical noise into the audio path um, that are that will be affecting the self noise of the system in the sending direction. Now, for packet switch calls, where things differ a little bit is we may want to check the self noise, or it may be more critical to check the self noise, the idle channel noise in the receive direction, because that's where we have the comfort noise generation occurring. So for a DTX enabled call, if you're sending a SID frame or you are receiving a SID frame, excuse me, your phone will interpret that SID frame and say, oh, this is silence, but I'm not going to present digital zeros. Let me present something that is comfort noise. So what you have to balance now is the difference between sort of a white staticky low level background noise to make sure that people still understand hey you know the channel is still alive nobody's talking but the call is still up the call is still running and the let me just present digital zeros nothing's going on just flat silence right and that becomes that becomes eerie and jarring so we definitely don't want to go for that and then as I touched on earlier, what happens if you're in, a, in an actual noisy call? How do you handle that balance with the comfort noise? So things become a little tricky for this situation. The measurement itself is exactly the same. We just look at the amount of energy in the long pauses that could occur in between utterances or in between sentences. And we evaluate how well uh, or how high or how low is that noise floor. And we strive to have something that is definitely not too high, but we don't want the digital zeros either. So uh, with that out of the way, let's talk about echo cancer performance because it is ultimately tied to delays of the system. And with packet switch calls, it can just make things a lot more difficult. Now, echo, of course, is when your device receives a signal, it could potentially echo that signal right back to the far end. Things haven't changed in that perspective. And our measurements haven't changed either. We still do things like TCLW or the speech-based double talk method for evaluating both attenuation and echo, and eQuest and others, spectral echo. We still have all these measurements available to us, but I think the key that we want to bring across is that these measurements become a lot more critical now because chances are your echo cancer is really stressing and maxing out trying to compensate for the added delays introduced by things like the jitter buffer and PLC algorithms on the incoming side, on the receive side, before the echo cancer has a chance to really grab any data and start doing its magic. So the procedures for TCLW, exactly the same. We send a known signal. We know the spectrum of the signal we send to the device, and we measure what comes back up. We measure the echo signal, do our spectrum of that, and then apply our weighting curves and, and uh, subtraction. No difference there. It's just that passing the threshold becomes a lot trickier. Now, here's another point with comfort noise. So if we specifically look at the echo loss in a packet switch call, there's two different things that we could run into here. Right? So if no uplink signal is detected, right? we're receiving a signal and we're not sending any echo signal back up. In the past, in a circuit switch calls, we were at the mercy of our call conditions, and there would be some low level noise in there potentially. But with a packet switch calls, if we have something like a voice activity detector saying, I don't see anything, 
we're not sending electrical noise. We're sending literally digital zeros up into the network. And so if you look at the top graph, look at the scale here. And what you would end up with is a TCLW or an echo loss score of something like 173 dB. Now, technically, that's a pass, right? You have to get something like 46, 54, that kind of range in order for us to say, eh, that's that's a well-performing device. So 173 dB, you pass and you get the green check mark. But it may indicate that something isn't right. This is my my typical example and I've seen numbers anywhere from two three hundred to seven hundred DB of echo loss which at first seems fantastic but at second glance you realize something might be wrong here and it could point to something like a voice activity detector so in general what I tell people is be wary of very high echo loss scores 100 plus db that's just not reasonable it shouldn't happen um, and it may be something like a voice activity detector that is in line and just simply saying i don't see any near end speech and therefore i'm sending absolute zero and so those numbers the 100 plus 200 700 db of echo loss are essentially divide by zero arrows you have so little signal coming back up when you divide by such a small number you get a very high resulting score that's the idea here that's what we get now another thing is for the echo law scores depending on the codec that you're using some of the codecs actually have built-in comfort noise so i tried this out on a couple different codecs and i found that for exactly the same device as above i just changed the codec and now i got a nice flat <laughs> echo signal at about 78 db down which is a pass and looks pretty reasonable but that's not actually my device that is a result of the codec itself having some comfort noise built into it and so for this case, for this particular codec, what you run into is 78 dB being the absolute max. So even if your device were better than that, there would be no way to tell because the codec would always introduce a minimum amount of noise at those levels. Now, from your perspective, if you're designing a device and you think about comfort noise, that's not necessarily something that would show up in a TCLW test because it is introduced on the receive side. But it is something that you have to be aware of. And that's where we would say, look at the idle channel noise and make sure that your, your comfort noise is not too high so that it could potentially impact the uh, overall conversational quality. Now let's take a look at packet impairments. So, we touched on the jitter buffer management system earlier and the jitter buffer management system is really just saying let me organize all the packets into a continuous stream one through whatever and present that sequentially to my user what we have here though more than just jitter or the variable delay is that we could also have packet loss so as I mentioned, no network is perfect, no phone is perfect, and no reception is perfect. And therefore, sometimes what we end up with is a stream of audio where several packets have been dropped. In this case, packet number three and packet number five never showed up, or they were delayed for essentially indefinitely to the point where it doesn't matter anymore. And the question that we have to answer is, for these very real scenarios, how does our phone or our communication device, how does it compensate for that event? How does it fill those gaps so that the user does not experience all of a sudden, you know, random 20 millisecond or 40 or 60 millisecond gaps in the audio reproduction? And that's where something like packet loss concealment algorithms come into play.
Now, once again, 3GPP has been quick to adopt this for the mobile community. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these methods trickle into other areas. So as you may be aware, networks around the world, US, Europe, other places, are slowly thinking about we ought to switch off our old 2G, 3G networks and move to packet switch networks altogether. So 4G, LTE, and they're dabbling with 5G. In doing so, what that means is it's not just the mobile community specifically that will be moving to um, packet switch calls. It's basically everybody. So uh, automotive, for instance, uh, those communities, the automotive industry will also have to deal with things like wideband, super wideband calls, which is one of the benefits of packet switch networks, but they also have to deal with some of the imperfections. Now, the measurement procedure given to us in 3GPP is to put our device in a quiet environment and then send a uh, ideal speech signal to the device. So it receives the signal, feeds it through its jitter buffer management. Now this is a non-impaired signal, so there's really nothing for it to do, but it'll make sure that the, um, the audio is presented to the user in a continuous manner. We do that for the ideal scenario and we use ITUTP863 or the Polka algorithm to evaluate what is the speech quality for this very long stimulus. Then we repeat the transmission, but we dial up some impairment. And now we calculate the speech quality again to see how does the network impairments affect the overall speech quality presented to the user. How does the phone or the device compensate for all of a sudden having impairments in the speech signal? Now, I did some testing for our own fun that I will share with you here today. Um, I took just two utterances that you can see displayed. And then I started dialing up as much impairment as I could stand. Now, this was a voice over Wi-Fi call. Uh, it was a SIP call. I have control over the network. No real network would ever allow something like 30 or 50% impairment. That is extreme. They would just simply drop the call and say, try again. This is not functional. But you can see as we dial up the impairments with the packet loss, the overall shape of the audio signal starts to degenerate and the resulting polka MOS score drops dramatically. So let me just, it's only two utterances. Let me play just a couple of them. I'll play the 2%, which is close to ideal. Then I'll bump it up and give you probably just the 20 and the 50%. And you guys can get a sense of, man, this device is really struggling to keep up now that so much of the information is missing. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Four hours of steady work faced us. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Four hours of steady work faced us. Juice lemons makes fine punch. Four hours of steady work faced us. So hopefully you got a sense of how hilariously poor it sounds with 50% packet loss. But in some sense, look, 50%, that's, that's extreme. The device actually does a fairly decent job of compensating um, and producing some form of audio that is that resembles our original utterance. But this is the idea. This is the what the devices have to contend with. Now, for the packet loss concealment test, 
one of my impairment profiles could have looked like this first plot, right? We could have had some jitter, so varying delay. We could have a, a couple packets dropped, which we did for sure, and some more jitter in our sequence of packets. But if I were to dial up the same amount, so let's say it was the 10% packet loss and X percent of jitter, what guarantees do I have that statistically it's going to look the same? I have zero guarantees because if we look at the profile, the impairment profile below, we have exactly the same amount of lost packets. We have exactly the same amount of jitter and delay. And so statistically, these two profiles are identical. But if we present this to our device, I can guarantee you that we are going to get very different scores for each of these, pack, uh, each of these impairment profiles. Because if you imagine the first five packets here being speech and then maybe four packets of silence and then the rest of it speech obviously for the second impairment profile all we're losing here would be silence whereas here you can see we lose a little bit of the speech in the first utterance and in the second utterance and the packet loss concealment algorithm would have to step in and try to help us and rectify the speech whereas here we're really just losing silence but statistically they're the same and that makes it a little dangerous if we're trying to evaluate the device performance. So in 3GPP, they specify something called TCN files. TCN stands for trace control for NetM. And essentially what it is, these TCN files are recorded real world network conditions that the community 3GPP has accepted as typical network conditions. And so in 3GPP, they have the, the baseline value, so no impairment. That's where we get our baseline MOS value. And then they have two impairment profiles, which are stored, I believe, 30 seconds. I think they're 30 seconds long, maybe longer, uh, which are then looped and applied over the entire 160 seconds. So we get the same profile started at the same time every time we run the test. So if you switch device or if you change something in your device, in your PLC algorithms, for instance, then any changes in MOS scores or performance of your device is not due to the randomly applied statistically generated impairment profile, that would be due to the improvements that you make to your device. So on the right-hand side, I've shown you the same timestamp and the impairment for each of the packets. So at about the 26 second mark, you can see that there's some variable delay, there's some jitter for condition number one. For condition number two, we still have delay and jitter, but we also incur some packet loss right around the 26 and a half second mark, for instance, which does not occur in condition one. But every time we dial up condition two, we get exactly the same profile, overlaid, ex overlaid exactly the same place with the speech. So the two are basically bit accurately synchronized with the same timestamp. So Taking the same device where I dialed up the impossible amount of impairment as before, I can also apply these conditions, condition one and condition two, and I can look at my MOS score versus time and say, for each of these segments, how does my device perform? And you can see there are differences between condition one and condition two, as there should be. Now, overall, it turns out that the device I used actually performed pretty well and gave us about a 3.5 MOS score for each of the conditions, which is great. But the fundamental point is, if I were to run this test again with my device using condition one in blue, I would get exactly the same performance as I did shown on this graph. There would be no change. And so I can trust that any changes as a result of my manipulation with my device.
Now let me throw you just a little curveball because there is a non-standardized approach to looking for packet loss. The idea is exactly the same as before. So present a very long stimulus file, real speech. And then instead of looking for the MOS score, we now take the level versus time of our ideal case and we take the level versus time of our degraded or our impaired case, and we look for differences between the two. In other words, this is where our device does not match up with the clean condition in the impaired condition. And so the device is failing in some sense. And so we can start to highlight a few spots just by doing a level versus time, a delta level versus time analysis, to look for where does the packet loss concealment algorithm fail us. Now for this particular utterance or, or test, you can see there's a couple of hot spots that stick out to us as issues. Now here's a different approach in the sense that it's exactly the same stimulus this is a little bit of an older analysis method, but it, it still may serve some value, which is why we mention it to you. But it uses the relative approach hearing model in 3D. So it analyzes the same 160 second time signal from 20 hertz to 20K, and then applies in colored here the amount of disturbance so that we can quickly analyze where are the issues? So this is something that was implemented in the HQS IP standard by Head Acoustics. Um, and it's something that you can still use if you're interested. Now these circles are from the previous test. And this is the 3D, the Delta 3D uh, relative approach analysis. So we did the relative approach of the clean condition, the relative approach of the impaired condition and subtracted the two to figure out where are the differences. And you can see that the two main hotspots that we found on the level versus time analysis still stick out, although here, eh, maybe a little bit to the left of it, and here, at right along the 50 second mark, the relative approach is telling us that this is something that would stick out, whereas this maybe not as much. So they give you slightly different results, but remember, one is a level versus time analysis, and the other is a hearing model. And so you have to balance the evaluation methods of each. In any case, so far, all we've focused on is the negatives of the packet switch calls. And I didn't mean to bum you guys out because there are, of course, lots to be excited about as well. And for one, we talk about the increased bandwidth that's available to us. Um, you know, we, we can start to introduce things like super wideband and full band calls. And in doing so, we also have to find a way to evaluate the speech quality and the conversational quality. Now, for conversational quality, one of the things that I would probably advise you to look at is the speech-based double talk method by 3GPP, because that is bandwidth independent. But for speech quality, I would recommend we look at ITUTP863 or the Polka algorithm. So that's something that we can use for most super wideband speech and get a good estimation of speech quality. But another thing is we can look at the new 3Quest algorithm. So standardized in TS103281, which is good up to 20 kilohertz. The idea here is, of course, 3Quest is a measure of the speech quality in noise. So we get three different MOS metrics, an SMOS for speech quality, an NMOS for noise suppression quality, and a GMOS for a global overall quality. And there'll be a lot more information about 3Quest in subsequent episodes. The point I want to make is we do have some tools available to us for measuring speech quality, which is something that packet switch calls allow us to do at higher bandwidths. So with that, I would like to wind down the episode 
with a bit of a philosophical moment. So as consumers push for more, and as you guys push further ahead, what happens when we evolve to something like 5G networks and next generation codecs like EVS that can do stereo signals? And we start experiencing things like augmented and virtual reality devices on the networks that are promising things like full band experiences in real time, right? So there's a lot of companies here, and this is really just a sliver of the cool companies out there that are trying to do these things and merging them. Now, what I would like to have you visualize, ironically, is a video conferencing call where the video quality is poor. I'm sure you've been on one of those calls and realized that, hey, I can still hear what people are saying. Can't really see what they look like. It's a little grainy, but you still stick on the call, right? But what happens when that video conferencing call has poor audio? How long do you hang around and look at somebody in, in beautiful high definition, but where you can't hear a word that they are saying? Right, so maybe I'll have a poll for you guys next time we do this, but chances are most people try to log off and log back in and hope the audio quality is better. And so the slightly philosophical thing here is as we start steaming ahead and doing all kinds of cool stuff with augmented reality and video conferencing, let's not forget that audio quality is one of the key things for generating an immersive experience. And without it, people just won't stay on the line. They'll forget about it. And so we need to be mindful of all these things we talked about today when we move to packet switch calls and next generation networks and future technologies. So let's wrap it up, put a nice big bow on it. I'll leave you with this slide with the metrics that we talked about today. And we'll just wish you a wonderful day. I appreciate your attendance and we hope to see you in future episodes.